Welcome to Inspired Parenting, Parenting from an Attachment and Trauma Perspective with Daphna Lender, a free eight-part monthly series. This is the eighth and final session. I'm Mary Frangie, Program Specialist at the Trauma Research Foundation, and whether you're a parent or interact with children in other capacities, we're sure you'll find this information encouraging and useful. And you'll find Daphna's hands-on tools, a resource you can apply right away. And it's not just about children. This work applies to people of all ages. Today's topic is how to validate a child's feelings, how to validate a child's feelings. We'll learn how to diffuse negativity and how to provide acceptance and empathy to help children understand themselves better. We invite volunteers to ask questions and have a conversation with Daphna on screen, either with your camera on or off. If you have a question, just raise your hand at any time and keep it raised. Please keep your questions relevant to today's topic and note that this discussion is not a substitute for, nor does it replace professional mental health advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you have any concerns or questions about your health, you should always consult with your physician or mental health professional. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe like and share. It tells YouTube this content is valuable and they'll show it to more people. It's my great pleasure to introduce our instructor. Family therapy expert and attachment specialist Daphna Lender is an international trainer and supervisor for practitioners who work with children and families. She is a certified trainer, supervisor, and consultant in both TheraPlay and dyadic developmental psychotherapy, as well as an EMDR therapist. Daphna's expertise is drawn from 25 years of working with families in many settings, at-risk after-school programs, therapeutic foster care, in-home crisis stabilization, residential care, and private practice. Daphna's style, whether as a therapist or a teacher, is combining the lighthearted with the profound by bringing a playful, intense, and passionate presence to every encounter. Daphna is the author of the books Integrative Attachment Family Therapy, and the co-author of TheraPlay, The Practitioner's Guide. She teaches and supervises clinicians in 15 countries in four languages, English, Hebrew, French, and Spanish. We are so grateful to have her. Daphna, thank you for being here. Take it away. It's my distinct honor to be with you all. So today we're going to talk about how to validate a child's feelings. So we all need to our feelings validated. It's a lot easier when you f when you agree with the person, but if it's your child and they're attacking you, complaining about you, they maybe you offered them support earlier and warned them about something and then they didn't listen to you and now they're in trouble or they lost something and now they're angry and complaining, it's a lot harder, right? That's when you need to validate a child more so than ever. But it confronts and comes up against our need to defend ourselves, to be right, to get our point across, to get our need across. And that's when it's, it's hardest to do that validation. But the paradox is, is that if you are able to do it, you will then be able to um, help the child to cooperate with you a lot more. So it's a paradox. But if you validate a child, they'll be more cooperative. All right. So how do we do that? Let me talk, talk to you about PACE, which is an acronym. It's playful, accepting, curious, and empathic pace. Playful, accepting, curious, and empathic. Let's write that down, write the acronym down so you can remember what it stands for, the, letter, the, the letters and what, the, um, what words it represents. It's an attitude. It's developed by Dan Hughes. He's the creator of PACE and Dyadic, Dyadic Developmental Psychotherapy. And he taught me this. <clears throat> when a child is coming at you and they're intense or they're complaining, they might not be angry, but they might be, oh, I don't want to. I can't. I'm too tired. This is boring. I don't want to go to school. Or they might be saying, how come I have to do everything? How come you don't ask my brother to do anything? Like you're totally 
um, giving him preferential treatment and treating me a lot harsher than you are him or some other complaint. Like you didn't let me do anything at, when I was younger and now I'm not good at anything or things that are, they are, they feel intense and, and you are feeling stressed about what they're saying. The first attitude that you would want to, you want to start with always is acceptance. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean I agree with you. It doesn't. It does not mean that you say you're saying he's right. You're saying I got you. I heard you. I register your point of view. So especially if it's something where it feels like you're, you know, they're really saying something that you're really opposed to. It's, it's like, it feels like you're coming up against a brick wall. You're fighting against what they're saying and saying, no, that's not true. I totally gave you, I gave you, I offered you piano lessons. I gave you sports, you know, lessons, or um, I gave you private tennis lessons. And I tried to encourage you to go to drama club and you didn't want to that. Now you're blaming me. You want to be able to say that, but actually you're just going to say, okay, got you. Thanks for letting me know what's on your mind. That's acceptance. And it just kind of like goes over the resistance and it's just, it's a way of smooth, just flowing with, and it breaks down a little bit of that wall because the kid is expecting you to argue back and be like, no, no. And, or, you know, complaining back. So by saying, got you, got you. Thanks for letting me know what's on your mind or, "Uh uh-huh. Okay. Good to know what you think or, oh, got it. Got it. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. Wow. We're, we're really not seeing eye to eye. I hear that. So without doing anything else, you've created a feeling of calmness and more cooperation just by the fact that the child was expecting whatever he was saying to get an, it's get it. He expects you to um, react intensely and you're reacting with like a flowing. So just keep in mind, you're going to come up against a feeling of like, Oh, that's not right. Or, Oh God, I can't believe he's saying this again. And you're, you're the next thing I want you to think of is flow. Flow mean accept. Got it. All right. Thanks for letting me know what's on your mind. It might feel artificial and you might feel like it's, you're like, your throat is stuck where you're like, that's not what I want to say. Or gosh, darn it, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to give him an inch and even um, give him a second to believe that I'm agreeing with him because I don't. It's going to feel that way. I really want you to allow yourself to feel that stuckness in your throat or that rate, you know, that sense of like surging, like, no. And then just you practice, you have to practice saying, okay, got it. Thanks for letting me know what's on your mind. Or, oh, okay. I heard, yep. I heard you. And I heard your concern. Aha. All right. That's, it's good to know your point of view. That is something that you have to practice acceptance. All right. After that, what comes next? You've already gotten a little bit more cooperation or just reduce the tension a little bit by um, not fighting with the child and not having that reaction of exasperation or arguing. Okay, so what's next? Empathy. Uh, You would acknowledge that from his point of view, it feels really crummy. It feels unfair. He's really stressed about it. Whatever the situation is, try to think, if I put myself in my child's shoes, what would that be like? And then express it. Express it as though you are actually in his shoes. Like you would 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 give it some some vibration or some energy, some movement in your body to make it feel like I got you. Like I understand if you're so tired. And because you stayed up so late last night watching TV and until all hours, even though, you know, in parentheses, you know, you told him to go to bed and he didn't listen. They would say, oh, God, yes, you are really you're it's exhausting. I know in the morning and it it feels like so heavy your head. 
it's just like, oh, got it. Your head is just like you're on your pillow and you're um, struggling to, 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 get, to get any energy. I believe you. So giving that moment of empathy is not going to detract from the agenda that you may have of him going to school. It's not going to cost you anything. And so when I say empathy and putting yourself in the person's shoes and showing with the vibration and the tone of voice in your, you know, in your, and in, 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 like to show you really are um, putting yourself in their shoes. It is different than being, than saying, I can see you're upset. I can see you're disappointed. I can see that you're mad. I understand that you're mad. Saying it in a dry way or in a way that's labeling the, 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 uh, feeling is like, I understand that you're disappointed. I understand that you're frustrated right now. That is, it feels distancing. It feels rote and that it doesn't feel genuine. And that's why I prefer not just labeling the feeling. So that's a tip. When you want to say something empathic, I want you to have some, some vibration in your voice, some facial expressions. Got it. Yeah. Not that would suck if you're so tired from staying up that your head feels really heavy and you're just like, oh, it's hard to face the day. I know that is more emotive and has a sense of like, wow, she really does understand me. She does really get me. That's the goal. Now, I then would think of what's another tool you could use from Pace. You could use curiosity, which is a question of like, I wonder, and then you would ask a question, just not a um, trying to analyze what happened. Like, I wonder why you didn't go to sleep on time like I told you to. That's not a curiosity question. That is not at all going to help. You are um, then trying to just sort of get your point across. So maybe you could say, I wonder what was making it so important to stay up so late and not go to sleep last night. Maybe they would tell you, well, I, um, you know, I, I don't go to sleep because I don't want the data, the next day to come because I hate going to school. At least then you understand better. So if you're going to ask a curiosity questions, it's truly wondering What's it like for you? What's it like for you when this happens? And um, so curiosity is really for the sake of getting to know the person better. A curiosity question could be, is there anything I could do to help it so that tomorrow it won't be the same way? Maybe I could ask, uh, could remind you in a different way or, or support you in a different way. When you do curiosity in a really genuine way, the person feels like you're collaborating with them rather than that you're uh, trying to diagnose them or force problem solving on them or lecture them. So we've covered acceptance, empathy, and curiosity. Where does playfulness come in? Well, it could come in anywhere that you might find it that like a lighthearted moment of any kind could um, make the kid giggle, divert their attention, make a connection between you two, just lighten the moment and bring some energy maybe, because that really helps too. So from the point of view of just seeing, you're not trying to do it to be sarcastic or mocking, you're not teasing and, and being hurtful in any way. But you could just be like, oh, my God, me too. I'm so tired. I just feel like oh. I could just I could sleep. I could sleep. You know, you could make um, a joke of some kind to be um, playful and connect. You could maybe do something like, say, if this this is not meant to be teasing. So if it was um if it was not a welcome playfulness, then you would say, oh, sorry, that was that joke was not was ill timed. But you might like take their foot and be say, is there is your foot really asleep, too? And kind of wiggle their foot to see. Um, is your arm also sleeping and raise it up and then, you know, if it falls down. So. 
And the, the, this idea of doing pace will help set you up for the next step, which is it is time for us to get out of bed and do the next thing, which is get breakfast, get dressed, go to school. And it's, it's not a guarantee that that's going to make the other part go well, but it's going to set you up for more cooperation. You might have to leave and come back after five minutes and, and do pace again. But the, the child is needing you to be with them. And this is a way to do it. That's a uh, sort of a, some, some ideas of being of validating a child's feelings. And then after you do that, then you can say something like, Hey, how about I bring your clothes over here and I'm going to help you to uh, get dressed for the next thing is if it's, it's time for us to um, get to the breakfast table. And I made, um, you know, I made cereal and you can help cut the fruit for the, um, the fruit topping. So you're kind of just inviting them to do the next thing with you and they're going to be more likely to cooperate. Okay. So you, you, you can do it in this situation of a child who is too tired and they don't want to get out of their bed. You can do it for things that are, that are more difficult, emotional things like, Let's say a child is a young, maybe a, a teenager, and they say, you know, something like, um, sometimes I, I wish I didn't exist. They say something bad about themselves, very negative. Maybe there's a very, they, they're expressing some really serious feelings. We get alarmed. Rightly so. It's really scary if our child said something like that. Um, the 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 feeling inside of a person who says that it could be they feel dead inside they feel completely overwhelmed they feel as though they are ineffective they're so lonely they feel really hopeless they feel a sense of dread people don't say those kind of things if they don't without feeling these feelings underneath they're real feelings they're not just trying to get out of going to school or getting um, attention or getting out of getting consequences. That might be part of it, but my experience is that the majority of it is they're feeling something is very, very painful or scary uh, or lonely inside, or they feel ashamed about something that happened. So if a child says something like that, our, our initial reaction in our body and remember it's always about you too as a parent that feeling of feeling like oh my god what are you saying like how could you say that what are you talking it, it feels so devastating and invalidating to you and remember that we have to note that feeling as we've done in 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 any of one of my previous workshops i always first have the parent focus on their reaction their physiologic reaction so you might get a surge of energy where you feel tightness in your chest or you want to you have heat or you get your shoulders get really tense and you just note that and give yourself a moment to breathe through it that's really key and uh to even if you already start you know reacting with a lot of emotion and dysregulation and start asking a bunch of questions you can you as soon as you catch yourself you can slow down and be like hold on a minute just let me a second i gotta take a breath and do a reset here sorry about that and just let that let that behavior go for the and start over let me know thanks for letting me know what's on your mind it was really important and courageous for you to tell me that i appreciate i really it's important for me to know what's on your mind that's acceptance empathy would say got it you know that is um that's it's a courageous thing to say it's also must be a really crummy feeling to to say and 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 it must really feel terrible inside 
then you wait for what the kid says and see what he says. He'd be like, hmm. You might, he might just like not say anything. Um, if he shrugs his shoulders, you say, hey, you know what? It's okay not to know. You probably don't know what to do, but you're doing great by telling me. So just really, really do acceptance and empathy and then a curiosity question. You could say something like, um, I wonder when this started feeling, when you started feeling this way, or could you tell me more about that? Or was there ever a time where you didn't feel that way? Or what helps? And if you, they may not answer. And if you say, you know what, you might have ideas, but you're not able to say them. That makes sense. Thanks for telling me. I want to help you. And um, um, sometimes we just don't know how. Um, we might you might want help, but you don't know how. And I'm ready to listen. For now, I'm going to uh, just uh, stay here. Is it okay if I stay here with you and we can watch a TV show together? I'll bring you a cup of hot chocolate. Okay. And of course, if they do say something like, um, you know, everything I do, um, like everything I do, like I ruin and I ruin all relationships, you would do acceptance, empathy, and curiosity again. And really, really try, mom, dad, parents, caregivers, try not to give advice and reassurance and reasons uh, why the, the child is not um, correct. It isn't that you would not say, hey, guess what? You're really valuable to me. And I really, really am happy that you exist. Yeah, you would say that. Of course you would say that. But that is not in the first five minutes of your conversation or whatever. The first, the first section of your conversa conversation has to be first acceptance and empathy and maybe a little curiosity because the person needs you to hear them out before you give them like why there should be, why he, they are uh, valuable, why they are successful and what they should do or how you're going to keep trying. Those are things that you would say, but not before you connect with Pace. So I was hoping that if, if those of you who are participating have some questions, maybe some experiences of what, what you know, and I can say what um what you might be how you might be able to approach a situation if you're interested in asking a question about how to validate a child's feelings by the way there's something i didn't say i am not i am not um, by by validating a child i do not mean that you should take abuse so if a child says you're so stupid i mean that's up to your personal decision if you're going to say i got it then glad to know what's on your mind. You might not, that might not be something that you can tolerate. And you would say, Hey, I do, I do not want you to call me names. I don't call you names and I don't want you to call me names. And then you would just go to back to acceptance. But you know what? Thanks for telling me what's on your mind that you are not happy right now. You're not happy with me. I get that. And same with not, if there's a consequences, that's ne a consequence that's needed just acceptance doesn't mean that you are not going to give a consequence. You still have to say the consequence at the end, say it is not okay to whatever the, the situation is, um, deal from your brother's room or um, go out when I told you you're not allowed to. And so then, you know, the, you're, you're going to be, um, you're not going to be able to use your bike if they went out on their bike or something related to what to the to the behavior, the misbehavior. Um, it's always good to make a consequence related to the misbehavior. But the 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 idea is you're not uh, excusing the behavior and then not dealing with it. So I have a question. I have somebody to dialogue with here. Hello, Matthew. How are you doing today? Thanks so much. Really good. Um, I, my question pertains to, um, I work with a lot of families who have adopted children and have gone, you know, experienced trauma. Um, and a lot of the time, the, the question I get from my parents, and I even face this with, with my own eight-year-old sometimes, is um, 
how do you work through that pace thing when the child can't, I, I guess, can't label what emotion they're feeling, uh-huh. um, you know, because sometimes they've experienced, like I said, the trauma they've experienced that they've been told feeling anger is bad or feeling scared is bad. So they don't want to say that, but so how, how do you work with a child to help kind of get them to, I, I guess, name their feeling if they're having that trouble doing so? Uh huh. That's a really good question. Thank you for it. You wouldn't ask, you wouldn't name it, ask them to name it. You would just sort of guess, say, you know what? It looks like, like you're doing this and it looks like you're feeling like kind of, I don't know, it could be maybe you're feeling a little like bumped out or something, or you're feeling like kind of like embarrassed or sh- or maybe sh- uncomfortable. Maybe that's a okay. guess that might be going on for you. And then they're going to not answer Matthew. They're going to go like this or they're going <laughs> to go like this when they yep. do that. Use the first, if the ever a child does like this, you say, Thanks for letting me know that you're you're listening, but you're not sure and you don't know for for sure. And that's okay. Okay. We might be on the right track, but they don't know and they're not going to acknowledge it or endorse it fully because if they do, it, they feel like they're going to get in trouble. Um, like, how could you, you know, how could you be angry at me when I've done so much for you or whatever? So the next step, Matthew, is also you want to make sure that the parents aren't being like, why aren't you answering him? Why aren't you answering Matthew? Or why aren't you answering me? And you say, hold on, um, mom. Okay. The kid is, first of all, I can tell that they're listening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's okay for them not to know. They may want to respond, but they can't right now. And then you 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 have to help the parent not to jump down the kid's throat and say like be like why yeah. aren't you answering? Okay. Okay. Thank you. That like I said that that helps me because my kid does that sometimes. But That's a lot like of the this, families mean, I work yeah. with, you know, it's it, you know because of that trauma that like you said they're they're afraid to name a feeling because they've been told that that's bad or that's they shouldn't feel that way in the past. So they try to not let you know they're feeling that way. For sure. For sure. Just make, make some guesses in a curious, in your curiosity kind of way and just be like, could it be that you might've felt um, like scared that you were going to get in trouble and that's why you did it, you know, and then just let it kind of lightly land on them, almost like little clouds that are falling on or <laughs> dew that's falling. It's not, you're not making like them say, is that yes or no? You can even tell by just their the way they're breathing or the way they look or they shift that it might be something they're considering. And you say, oh, are you maybe considering that one? Okay. That might be part of it. Okay. So read the body language. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Hello, Linda. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, So my little guy is, I feel like I can do pretty well if he is down in the dumps or like you said, some of those, I can meet those emotions, the sadness and, and even the anger a, okay, a little bit, but when he is just like kind of manically distracted, and maybe just so, and so instead of getting ready for school, he's just playing at top notch, and and so I'm constantly. I mean, I feel like that's what my parenting with him is constantly trying to. And this great summer's been great. He hasn't had to do sometimes much, but when we have to get out the door or do something. I start to find myself not being, I mean, I don't know how to connect with him and empathize, you know, it's like the rush and we got to go and you're not doing anything you have to do. Yeah. Um, I hear you. And at those times, um, okay. Acceptance, empathy, and curiosity play <laughs> playfulness might work, but acceptance, empathy, and curiosity won't work for those times because if he's jumping around manically and like, 
I don't know if there's something that he's trying to avoid. Maybe transitions are scary because maybe I don't, I don't know what happened. If things, bad things happened to him in his past or some, some, you know, insecurities and inconsistencies, but at those times they can't listen to the acceptance, empathy, and curiosity. That's my guess. So you would need to just, you can't talk to him from across the room. You would need to, Go over to him. You would need to put your hands on his shoulders, on his back. You'd need to hold his hands. You would need to walk him over to where he needs to go. If he is like screaming or something, you would give him something like a drink to suck with a straw or something to hold on to. Um, maybe you would like sing a song while you're trying to move him in the direction of the, the door. Um, but it has to be physical and it has to be rhythmic. And you have to kind of do it like with him. Um, so just check if you're looking, if you're like saying like, come on, it's time to go. It's put your shoes on. Stop playing with the video game. That's definitely not going to work. You have to go over there and do, do it with him. Mm -hmm. you, and okay. he won't do anything. You can't expect him to do anything by himself. Like you're just going to have to do it with him. I guess that goes in line with his real age is half of what his, said age is yeah because he'll always say that's... yes okay sure but next thing i know he's just you know acting like a lion on the trampoline you know so oh yeah well don't worry about some parents think if if he's doing that and he can't do what i'm asking link when will he grow up and be able to be responsible and independent and there's a it's a panic that sets in like what is this is a test and he's not passing this test there's a, a sense of stress so try to put to notice that sort of stress inside of you and then put it aside he will to the best of his ability grow up and be independent but he's even he's going to be he'll have more of a chance to be successful if you do it with him now than you know, have this dynamic where he's not listening. And then there's that whole mm -hmm. um, well, battle between you. Yeah, that's the problem. It's the battle, not so much the worry that he won't be able to do it one day, but that he's, he's not doing what he knows. You that that's expected of him. And then he feels bad about himself residually. And then that comes up like I'm a bad boy and what's wrong with me. And that's the thing that we definitely we don't, we, nobody wants that. So it's that he can't do it instead of that. He won't. Yeah. Do it. He wants, yeah, he can't do it. Um, he can do it with you, um, but he can't do it by himself. He needs, he needs you to be his co-regulating mm -hmm. other. The co-regulating other is somebody who does it with you um, in a rhythmic way, in a playful way, you know, help him to put his, shoes on by doing a little race of like you put on one shoe and I'll put on the other, um, bring his backpack to him, you know, get on the trampoline and jump him off with your hand, you know, mm -hmm. that that's, it's tiring, but it, and it's labor intensive, but it's less labor intensive emotionally. If you do that, than to say, Hey, come on, come on. Yeah. Thanks. Sure thing. So Gloria and Catherine both had similar questions around using pace, one in a violent, aggressive classroom, the other in a very similar situation to what uh, Linda described. If either of you have any follow-up on your question or didn't get enough information from Daphna, please feel free to raise your hand so we can follow up and you can have further convo with Daphna. Um Michelle is so appreciative of this. She's saying, my granddaughter will say, you think I'm a horrible person or I'm a horrible person. I hate myself. Mm -hmm. And Alyssa is asking a follow-up around in those kinds of serious situations. How would you incorporate the playfulness? Um, I'm afraid that there's a lot of instances in which playfulness isn't appropriate, but the uh, opportunities might come out in once the child is feeling a little better. Um, but if, you know, the, the, uh, the kid who says, I, sometimes I wish I didn't exist or, you know, you hate me, you think I'm a bad person or something like that. I think playfulness wouldn't 
be appropriate. So it just has to be used judiciously and where, you know, where it's appropriate. I don't know if, um, I guess if a child was, you know, whining or falling on the floor and the parent was like, me too, I don't want to, I want to fall on the floor as well. As long as the child doesn't feel that the parent is uh, mocking them. So there's, it's, 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 it's spontaneous. Um, I don't know if there are other questions, but the one person about asked about uh, an, an aggressive child in a classroom. Um, would you be able to read me that one? Sure. How can we use pace with a student destroying a classroom and being violent or aggressive? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So a kid who's destroying a classroom is in fight or flight and the the situation, of course, the uh, all school staff know that the most important thing is to protect the other children first. And sometimes they will move all the children out of the classroom. Uh, imagining a child who is throwing chairs, knocking tables over, throwing things, calling the teacher names and so on. And that person, that child is in fight or flight. So when you're in flight or flight, you're going to be really, you won't be able to listen to any logic and you won't be able to respond to any curiosity questions like saying, you know, hey, could this be about that you really didn't, you didn't, you know, you didn't like the way that kid looked at you or you didn't like the, the you, you were disappointed about your math test. They won't be able to answer the idea is at that point to try to reduce the stimulation by giving them something to drink or something to eat, letting them hide under a, um, like in a corner with um, blankets and pillows, allowing them to go to a different place in the, in the school that is um, more like their, their safe place, like an, like a cave. They will, otherwise they will run away or they will be aggressive. They have very few choices. It's fight, flight, or, or fight, uh, fight or flight. Um, and so hiding is uh, really one of the best options for a, a school situation. And you have to reduce the stimulation. It takes like 20 minutes for a child to calm down from a situation like that. And during that time, they need low stim like so not any like not the, the the auditory stimulation needs to be reduced don't talk to him um you can talk in another part of the room but just talk in a really like in a storytelling voice like that's i got you he he would you know or he was upset but now he's calming down and he's doing the best he can and so only after that will there be an opportunity to talk with pace, but that's after the child's completely calmed down. And you might do it while walking around the block or doing another activity that has movement. So possibly by, you know, when you're shooting hoops or doing another um, activity in, in a, in a gym or something like that, it's, you would say, you know, you probably got upset because you had, a really good reason. And I got you, I'm sure from your point of view, and I wonder what that is. So yeah, using curiosity. Great. Thank you. So Catherine asks, how do you get a parent to practice pace and be more expressive if they always talk in a monotone voice in general? I'm a counselor and I have struggled to get some parents, particularly dads, to find ways to be more expressive when that's not naturally how they speak. Yeah. Wow, that's a really good question. So it is, it's, it's the, uh, the empathy, the acceptance, the curiosity really does come out in the tone of voice. So if a parent is always talking like this and they're saying, I understand you're upset, I understand, then the, the child won't feel it. I would, in my, um, my experience, one of the most important things is to ask them about how their parents spoke to them and whether they've had experience with people with their parent empathizing with them and really putting 
their parents really um, put themselves in their shoes? Do they know what it feels like? Perhaps it could be something where it might be more just of a neurodiversity issue where they sp- where they speak like that um, as a uh, just just their natural set point. I would, other than asking them if they how they were spoken to and empathized with, to help them to note the difference between what their natural temperament and their child's temperament, and that it's the parent's job to come closer to the child. And when we're looking at temperamental differences, the parent's the one who's, he has to stretch. And so I would do exercises with him, like, can you play a game with me of peanut butter and jelly, where I'll say peanut butter in a funny way, and you say jelly in the same way I say peanut butter, and I'll say, okay, you say, I'm going to say peanut butter, peanut butter, and I'll ask the dad, can you say jelly in the same way I said peanut butter, and then I'll have, I'll say, peanut, and see if he can play around um, and exercise his, his voice tone. And see if he can use his eyebrows, just do a little mirroring back and forth with with facial expressions and then switch roles. So that's where playfulness can really be helpful. Great, thank you. Jonathan's asking, how might I handle situations where a toddler expressing big feelings primarily goes to the other parent? When both of our toddlers rush to one parent, what can the other parent on the sidelines do to chip in, both with the kids and with the parent being bombarded? Mm, Yeah, that's a really interesting dynamic. Well, it is very overwhelming if one parent is getting both toddlers coming towards towards her and uh, she can't, you know, manage giving her her attention to both and i would it would be i think it would be appropriate to really try to step in and to be close to if it's i'm assuming forgive me for the assumption um i could just say parent a but it could just be mom um the both toddlers are coming at her demanding her attention and they're both sad or whatever for um the the father to come close and also uh, be really compelling and just um, and be very uh, persistent. Be like, oh, I got you. You feel sad about something and you didn't like that when your brother did that. I got you and hold the kid, the child's hands or stroke their hair, maybe pick them up and um, um, and, you know, I'll put them on your lap and rock them and swing them. Or um, walk them over to the window and, you know, show them the birds outside or something like that. If a child is saying, mommy, um, uh, you would be like, I got you. I know you love mommy so much. And wow, you were so upset. So I would try to make yourself somebody who is, you know, a compelling target to come to. Um I think you would have to be pretty interventionist in this situation and not let both children just bombard, um, you know, parent A. Great. Thank you. Melanie's asking, she says Mm -hmm. her son struggles after getting home from school and he's constantly picking on his siblings and has lots of anger when told to do anything. I try Mm -hmm. to suggest certain activities, but he refuses to do anything, even though I know they would be beneficial for him. Mm -hmm. Um, It would be helpful to know how old he is. Um, Yeah. Melanie, Melanie, would you like to raise your hand and come on? You can keep your camera off if you like. Yeah. Or at least chat, chat to me what, how old he is, but the, um, when a, a child comes home and they're really irritable after school, my, my they, I, I think the, the, this, the sense is, is that they are really, they're tired, they're overstimulated, they might have felt rejected. There's a lot of things that go on in school where a person, especially a person who's very sensitive, can feel rejected. And the idea is, is uh, to try to do something 
right away that's very nurturing for that child. So instead of, you know, just saying, oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Is to right when they walk in the door, um, give them a hug, give them something to eat, give them something to drink, ask them if they had a hard day, um, set up a warm, like a, a cozy or quiet space for them to be. And just let them know that you respect that they are, that that they um, may have had a, a, a tiring or hard day and that hard things happen and showing them a lot of empathy, giving them a lot of, as I said, drink food and drink and, and rest time. Um, then you can also, that's, you can, then you can also say, uh, you, but you can't hit your siblings and, and tease them. That's not a way to um, handle this. And, and then, you know, when you suggest things that he should do, um, because he doesn't have that feeling of like, he feels, you know, some like stressed out or hurt or wounded inside. He doesn't want to do those things. Um, you might just say, oh, you know what? If you could, you would read a book or if you could, you would play with Legos or if you could, you would organize your room, but you can't because you're, you're, you're just not in that state of mind. I get, I get it, you know, so He's nine. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, that does. That was about, I think that's about the age I was referring um, my advice to. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Anne is asking, she mm -hmm. says that Vermont allows restraint and seclusion in classrooms when a kid is out of control. And she's curious mm -hmm. what your thoughts are about that. Um, restraint and seclusion in classrooms. Well, um, I certainly am not happy about it at all. I think that it could be a lot of things that you could do before you had to restrain a child. And, um, in one thing is a child needs a place to go and they need to be allowed to go to that place. And that will be a, and they need to practice going there if they're feeling upset. Um, if they have no out, they will get they will, um, and they're in, you know, they're, they're in trauma mode, then they're in fight mode, then they'll fight. And if you have a person, uh, you know, if they get grabbed and restrained, that just creates, that continues the cycle. So I want a plan for if you're feeling stressed out that you go to a special um, area, like a room where you have a ton of um, sensory things, uh, some place to hide a place for with a, with drinks and snacks, a place that you can hide and also that's quiet or you can put headphones on um, and that you're able to use that as a place instead of fighting. And yeah, and um, seclusion, when that, when I hear that, it seems, it sounds like the seclusion that where you're, um, put into an empty room or, you know, there's nobody with you, there's nothing there and you're locked in and that's really painful. Um, so I would get away from that all altogether. I would like a child to be able to voluntarily go someplace. And then um, the best thing is like, give them something to hold on to, like a big teddy bear or pillow to hide, getting something to drink and something to um to a snack and then possibly like reading them a story or not leaving them alone, being close by not necessarily talking to them. They're definitely not talking at them, but letting them know that like, for some, you know, I'm here for you. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Danielle asks, uh, we're getting ABA therapy. What do you think? Okay. Or do you think it's appropriate to use pace with ABA? I think it's always appropriate to use pace. Um, if there is contradictory information that you're receiving from the ABA therapist, um, when you talk to her about, oh, can we use pace? Then I would challenge the therapist to maybe see where pace could fit in. Uh, I am... Um, I don't want to knock ABA, but I do feel that there's more of an external, like there's a reward focus of, and it's more external. And I want to focus on the internal experience of feeling connected, feeling understood, feeling calmed by the fact that my parent really gets me 
and feeling like, oh, I, 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 I'm not a bad Kurt person for feeling the way I do. There's a reason why I do. And um, I'm not like alone with it. And all people need that. So I'm hoping that it, that it doesn't contradict. Um, but you could, you could maybe ask your therapist how you could um, incorporate that. Very good. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question or comment if anyone would like to reach out. Um, I do have a question from Anne. A four-year-old gets upset when she does or does not get what she wants, loves to talk about her feelings and go through pace steps until it's time to follow through and stop the behavior. Then she gets very upset, screaming, mm -hmm. et cetera. When she does not get her way and it escalates until mm -hmm. it, she gets her way, how to set limits? Suggestions for how to set limits. Okay. Um, at some point, I mean, the pace is, I, you know, I know you're upset. You really want the cookie. It, it tastes so good and you love it. And there's, there's, you know, there's times for cookies and there's time for not. And today, right now, it's not a time for cookie. And I know you really, you're really sad about that. And you're really mad at me too. I get it. I believe you, you know, and you're doing that. So that's the pace. And the, you know, the child might say like, I am, I'm really upset. I'm really mad at you. You want, want the cookie. I want it. And you keep doing pace. And then, you know, she might try to go and grab the, the cookie jar or she might, you know, try to go around you and, and um, go, you know, into the cabinet or something, or she might throw something. I don't know if those are the, um, the scenarios, but, um, you would have to, you know, um, turn her away or steer her away. Say, no, we're not, we're not doing that. That's not an option. I know you're really sad about it and just keep, um, hopefully keep the boundary of just by physically being able to, you know, turn her in the other direction. Um, the, um, screaming, is or kicking as long as she you know if, if a person if a kid flings a toy at you they're like it's like a stuffed animal or something and it didn't hurt you i wouldn't comment about it I, I i i think a child should be able to scream and flail and cry and you just say you know what i got you it's we're going to get through this it's going to be over soon you're not in trouble you're not a bad kid and just let them have those um behaviors and eventually that they they will um settle down and they might even come to you and you know ask for solace and put their head in your lap and cry that way and, and then you can stroke their hair or give them comfort with your um by putting your hand on their back but uh, I wouldn't react to the the, um, the screaming and the crying in by, you know, looking at them and saying, now you stop that. Do not do that. And if, you know, if the kid says in the moment, um, you're a jerk, you're mean, you're a bad mom. I wouldn't react to that because you can't argue with a person who's having a tantrum and be like, I am not. Stop doing that. Stop calling me names. I wouldn't do that. I'd be like, I got you. It's going to be over soon. And you'll, we'll feel better soon. And, um, you know, you're not in trouble. You're not a bad kid. That's what I would say. Thank you. And for Linda and probably the rest mm -hmm. of us, could you just repeat the goal? Is the goal to uh, focus on the inner feeling of connection instead of the external reward? Oh, yeah. So referring to ABA and the idea of, you know, you, you, make a really specific in ABA, you make a very specific target goal and you keep the child focused on that. And then when they do it, they are rewarded. It could just be with a smile or a touch or it could be with candy or with privilege. I am thinking of the child is feeling something under, if with pace, they're feeling something inside and it's, they're feeling like they have a, they're hurting or they're scared or they have um, they feel misunderstood or lonely, and that's why they're, you know, not cooperating or they're acting out. So by saying, by using pace, it helps the child feel more connected with their parent. 
I'm not alone. My parent understands me. And also I'm not a bad kid. There's a reason there's some like a reason why I do what I do. And it makes sense to somebody. And that makes a person feel so much better, more validated, more connected. And that those are the goals. Thank you, Daphna. I think we are, I think it's time to wrap it up. It uh, is. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for your questions and your vulnerability. It really makes this program very rich. Daphna, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. It's been a wonderful series. And this is the conclusion of our 2023 Inspired Parenting Series. But you can find the complete collection, all eight sessions, when you sign into your TRF account and go to My Purchase Content. And you can learn more about Daphna at daphnalunder.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. We hope that you'll enjoy the replays. Thank you. Thank you, friends, for coming.